Good morning. I'm in the conference of the APA in Washington, D.C. I'm going to interview for the leadership of State of Mind, the Italian Psychology Web Journal, the colleague Antonio Antonio, Antonio Scioli. He's one of the major researchers about hope. This interview will be about hope. He's professor of psychology in the University of New Hampshire system. He is also born in Italy in Cantalupo si. and came to Italy, not to, he came to USA in, uh, when you were... Quattro, in, quattro anni. Quattro anni. Quattro he anni. also speaks good Italian. The interview is in English, but... <laughs> un poco. So what about your uh, general orientation? I would say I'm eclectic. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, I would say it's a combination of cognitive behavioral and psychoanalytic. But I also incorporate some um, uh, humanistic, spiritual concepts, some family psychology. My philosophy is let's use whatever we need to mm -hmm. use to study the human being. Let's not be slaves to one tradition and try to squeeze everything into that tradition. Hope is very complex as people are in general, we need to use whatever we need to use. Uh -huh. That's my philosophy. You told me that your mentors were... Uh, your mentors, I don't remember. Tell us your well, mentors. They, in, in, at least in the United States, and I think maybe in certain circles, even around the world, they're probably very well known. Mm -hmm. uh, one was the, probably the leading researcher of achievement, David McClelland at mm -hmm. Harvard, who was there for 36 years at Harvard was one of my main mentors, and also James Averill, mm -hmm. who's a very well-known emotion researcher. Uh, they didn't study hope. They studied, in the case of James Averill, social construction of emotion, and David McClellan, need for achievement, the leading researcher on need for achievement. And so I, I took a lot of general principles about how to study people, how to go about looking at motivation and emotion from them, and then I took my content, which was hope, and I, and I brought the two together. And when you started <coughs> thinking about hope, you, you felt that there was something missing and you need this to introduce this concept of hope. Absolutely, absolutely. What was missing? Well, um, first of all, I would say uh, nursing and philosophy have done a much better job with hope. Psychology, I thought, was terrible when it came to hope. <laughs> in, in particular, if you look at the literature, two of the most important dimensions of hope are attachment mm. and spirituality. And you yes. don't find that in the psychology of hope. Ah. You don't. And even if it comes to survival hope, hope for survival, you see that a lot in medicine and nursing. So if you think of hope in terms of mastery, attachment, mm. survival, and spirituality, which would cover all the literature on hope, you could say psychology probably covers 25% at best, maybe even less. So I saw that and I said, something's got to be done because I always thought implicitly or explicitly what we were about in psychology was building hope, assessing hope and building hope. And I couldn't find really much hope in psychology. So that was my, my aim, was to look at the best constructs, the best ideas mm -hmm. about hope and build over time an integrative model, a theory, an approach to, to hope that would be truly holistic and bring in all the best ideas from all the disciplines. So in your model there are how many axes? Or there are four dimensions. major dimensions. Dimension. Yes. There's attachment, yes. which I think you could simplify it and call it um, trust and openness. And some people who are familiar with Eric Erickson, for example, will remember that in his first stage of development mm. he emphasized trust. Mm. And he said that if you have enough trust, you'll develop the capacity for hope. Not a specific hope, but the general capacity to hope. So there has been a little bit on trust, but trust and openness under attachment. Mm. For mastery, I would say it's about empowerment and collaboration. Big goals, not small goals, but life-defining goals. That is what the mastery aspects of, of hope are about. Mm. Then we have survival hope, which I think is a combination of self-regulation 
The absence of fear is another way to talk about self-regulation and hope. And also liberation. Liberation is, is a major theme in art and literature that's related to hope. If you look at the ancient Greeks, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you would be put in chains. Ah, yes. When the devil comes, mm -hmm. he brings chains. Mm -hmm. ah, Zeus, yes. Zeus tied Prometheus to a rock yes. because he brought light and hope to human beings. So this is one of the key concepts in, in hopelessness, uh, you know, that you are chained, that you, mm -hmm. you, you can't get away, you cannot escape. And so if, uh, if uh, we take then by, by extrapolation, hope should be about liberation, should mm -hmm. be about release. And then we have spirituality. For, for much of humankind, one of the major sources of hope is spirituality. And yet we find nothing in the psychology of hope mm -hmm. traditionally. And then you could ask me, well, what do you mean by spirituality? What is spirituality? What does spirituality mm -hmm. do for people? Yeah. I would go back and say, you know, I think it parallels the three needs that underlie hope, which is attachment. Some people use spirituality to connect. Mystics, mm -hmm. mystics, people who want to, to, to um, have a close presence with a higher power or force. So some people use spirituality for attachment. Rumi. Rumi is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the poet, the poet of Islam, uh -huh, the great yes. Sufi poet, yes. who said that um, mysticism is the portal of hope. Mm -hmm. Mysticism is the entry into hope. So there's a lot of, of attachment uh, concepts in literature that are related to hope. Um, but I also think that people use spirituality for empowerment. Mm -hmm. People find strength. There's the, a famous phrase from a uh, famous phrase from Saint Paul mm -hmm. in, the, in the New Testament: "I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me." Mm -hmm. And there's also, I think, a need for assurance and um, and terror management mm -hmm. through spirituality. In fact, there is people in social psychology, the terror management group, they call themselves, who believe that the only function of religion is terror management. I don't think that's true. That's going too far. But so I do think that there's this really strong component of hope that's related mm -hmm. to spirituality. So you have these four dimensions. Uh -huh. uh, you can then look at the sub-constructs within each dimension. Uh -huh. And maybe you, you, know, you could end up with 16 to 24 individual constructs, you know, th two or three, four perhaps, with each of, the, of those four big dimensions. Yeah. You can break attachment, master survival, and spirituality further down, which is what I did. I developed the theory, and then what I did from that is I developed uh, measures. Mm. And so, yeah, what, yes. Do you want me to go into the measures? I'll go into the measures. No, I want. Go ahead. Just before the measures, what about the difference with the, the other researcher of uh, hope? It's nice. Well, there, there's, there's, a, there's a tradition mm. of research on yeah. hope. It's not that no one has ever done anything on hope, but beginning around 1960, mm -hmm. There was a, a behavioral psychologist named Maura mm -hmm. who looked at hope in terms of reinforcement, very simply. Uh -huh. Then there was Stotland, who was a cognitive psychologist, who said hope is about the probability of achieving an important goal. Mm -hmm. After him came Snyder, and Snyder had this idea that hope was about the willpower mm -hmm. and the way power, the, the, the perception of options towards an important goal. But it's one line of research. It's the same tradition. It's narrow, it's very cognitive, and it's focused on mastery. Mm -hmm. There's no attachment, there's no survival, there's no spirituality. Even the mastery part is more of an individualistic, goal-oriented framework. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't really think that the great philosophers, the poets, even scientists in other field have narrowed hope so much as psychologists have. So there's a big difference, big difference. I really question whether that tradition really captured hope. Mm. So you integrated new dimensions in uh, your concept of hope, and then you developed instruments, measuring instruments. Exactly, exactly. My mm. thought was, let's have a strong foundation. Mm. We need a conceptual foundation. Don't just go out and measure something. Let's develop. Mm. A, a really solid base, a theory. Mm -hmm. Then let's develop some measures. So I first started developing measures from a, for adults. And I did it mm -hmm. the, the traditional scientific way that we develop mm -hmm. measures. So I developed a pool of questions from those constructs that I mentioned, mm -hmm. attachment, mastery, survival, and spirituality. 
once I had my pool of items, I did factor analysis. Hmm. After I did factor analysis, I did structural equation modeling. After I did that, I, I looked at um, measures that were established, that were proven to be valid in terms of measuring attachment, mastery, survival, and spirituality. Hmm. And, and um, I did concurrent validation studies to show that my measures were correlated hmm. with measures. So attach, my measure of attachment hmm. correlates with measures of attachment in yes. that exist. Um, then what I also did is some other studies that you could call them clinical, more clinical mm. studies. There's a measure that looks at the willingness to seek psychotherapy help. Mm. My measure of hope correlates with willingness to seek help. My measure is negatively correlated or inversely correlated with the Beck depression inventory. But um, some other interesting studies that we did, for example, were uh, I measured trait hope and I also measure state hope. We gave my measure of trait hope to people, mm -hmm. and we found out whether they were low or high, and then we introduced a film um, that reminds you of your own mortality. Hmm. Uh, the Philadelphia movie, in which Tom Hanks dies yes. of AIDS, mm -hmm. and we collapsed the movie into 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Very dramatically, you see him get sicker and sicker and sicker. It scares you. It makes you think about your own death. And these are college students. For whom yes. This, this uh -huh. kind of a sexually transmitted disease is very poignant, very powerful. And what we found is if you were higher in my measure of trait hope, hmm. your score on a death anxiety scale after viewing the film was much lower. It didn't shock you. It did not increase your level of death anxiety uh -huh. to be thrown this film at you that reminded you of your death if you were high in trait anxiety. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, a study we did with my measure of state hope, which is a more momentary, how are you feeling right now in terms of your hope? What we did is there's this famous Martin Luther King speech, I have a dream, mm. I have a dream. And what we did is we know that film brings up a lot of hope, makes people feel very hopeful. So what we did is we had two groups. One group looked at the Martin Luther King films, uh, mm. film. Another group did a boring task. And then they took my measure of state hope. And the people who saw the Martin Luther King film, film uh, their hope scores went way up. Mm -hmm. it, it shows that my measure of state hope is clinically sensitive. If you do something that is boosting hope, mm -hmm. my measure of state hope will pick it up. It will pick it up. And now I've also gone to develop um, split half, like shorter versions of mm -hmm. the state hope measure. Because in theory, what you could do is give the shorter split half version A before therapy, sometime during therapy mm -hmm. or after therapy, give version B, so you could do a pre and post comparison. The statistics, by the way, for my measures are very strong. We know, for example, in psychometrics that any scale to be considered reliable has to have an alpha of 0.7 or higher. All of my scales, the total hope score, as well as the attachment mastery survival, they all have alpha levels that are very high, 0 0.85, 0 0.87, 0 0.88, et cetera. So it's a very reliable measure. Uh, my measures are not correlated with social desirability. They are not mm. contaminated by distortion. They're ah. not correlated with socioeconomic status. Ah, yes. I... The, the, the trade hope scale also, I compared it to the MMPI repression scale. It's not correlated, which which is important to me because I want to show that when I'm measuring hope, I am not measuring repression, I'm not measuring denial, I'm measuring uh, hope. Ah, uh, yes, I'm it's measuring great. hope. And yes. It's not the same thing yes. as denial or repression. Yes. Uh, to give you another example, mm. which is kind of related to what I'm talking mm. about right now, uh, we did a study with aid services in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We looked at people with HIV infection. Yes. And we measured my trait hope we took my measure of trade hope. Then every year, we, we were able to get a blood sample, and we mm -hmm. looked at how much CD4 was in a millimeter of blood, how strong mm -hmm. was their immune system. And what we found is that the people who were higher in trade hope mm -hmm. consistently maintained a stronger immune system. And by doing some uh -huh. careful statistics, we were able to show it was not that they were healthier to begin with, and that's why they had more hope. It really was hope that was predicting the mm. immune health of the individual. Yes. 
But going back now and relating that to what I just talked about a minute ago about the robustness, the statistical robustness of the measure, I asked a, 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 a staff member at the AHIV um, facility mm -hmm. to rate independently, without looking at the HOPE mm -hmm. scores, how committed was the person with HIV, each person, how committed were they to getting better, and how much denial were they in with respect to their health. Mm -hmm. And what we showed is that the HOPE scores on the self-report, my self-report measure of HOPE, they were positively correlated with commitment to get better. Mm -hmm. The more hopeful the person, an independent staff person, also rated that person as more committed to getting better, oh. to taking steps, taking their medicine, to remaining as healthy mm -hmm. as possible. And it was negatively correlated with denial yes. as rated by the <clears throat> staff person. So that gives you some independent you know, evidence mm -hmm. that this is not a measure of denial. And it is related to actively engaging and taking care of your, of your, of your health. Mm. And I also guess that this larger concept of hope is a sort of a, a, a larger concept of motivation, which motivation is not only the strict cognitive commitment to stay better, but is a less so you think uh, it might be one aspect of motivation? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think that clinical application may be to encourage a client to conceive uh, the motivation in a, in a larger way. You know? That's not, true. Not only I want to stay better, but just spirituality, etc. Right. I, I, yeah. Yes. I think is that it, one of the... Is this right? I think so. I think... Yeah. I think there's two, two ways to think about that for me. One is that um, motivation itself is complicated, mm -hmm. is multidimensional, and hope yes. might be part of that. But, but then stepping back, mm -hmm. taking an even bigger picture, there's in health, in health uh, behavior change, mm -hmm. in that area of health behavior change, there's been this idea for a long time that information will make a difference. And it might make a difference. Uh, this is the whole area of health beliefs. The idea that if you tell people, oh, if you do this, if you do that, if you do this, they will, they will take that information mm -hmm. and they will make changes in their behavior. If they know that this, this leads to cancer, if they know that doing, eating these kinds of foods, if getting mm -hmm. physicals, if doing screenings, if they know all this, it will make a big difference. Well, the research shows it makes some difference. But you have to factor in emotion and motivation. Uh -huh. You have to factor that in. If people have um, no hope that that their actions will make any difference, they're not going to go get uh -huh. a screening. They're not going to. They're not going to stop smoking. They're not going to stop drinking. They need to believe that it's going to make a difference. They need some hope. And in clinical terms, in psychotherapeutic terms, how do you introduce hope in a session? On in a number right. of sessions. Well, I, you know, as we're talking about this, I guess we've covered the first two phases yeah. of my work. Yeah. Developing a model, yeah. uh, developing assessment tools. And by the way, uh, and this is also going to be related to what I say in a minute about therapy, but when it comes to assessment, you know, one of my mentors, David McClellan, who did all this work on need for achievement, he always believed that self-reports, questionnaires were limited. Mm. And what he liked to do was introduce the TAT or picture story exercises, something to measure unconscious or implicit yeah. motives. And so one of the things that uh, I've been also doing is using my multidimensional model of hope to develop coding systems, coding mm. schemes, little, little manuals to do content analysis so that you can do content analysis of speech samples to find out how much implicit hope a person has. Ah, yes. In addition to their self-reports, or if you want to study what some people might call hope at a distance, mm. if you want to look at the hope of politicians that have mm. died 100 years ago, analyze their, their speeches, their addresses, ah, yes. and right. then you use my multidimensional model, break it down, develop a scoring system, and try to pull out how much hope they actually 
uh, presented. I did that research with the presidents of the United States, the last 10 elected presidents, to see how much hope was in the inaugural speeches uh, of Eisenhower, and, Kennedy, uh, Obama, all these people. And did you find that how is changing hope? How is it not changing? Well, one of the things I found is that the best predictor of success in office were the presidents who uh, promoted survival hope. Uh -huh. That was uh -huh. the most important. Mastery hope was not a very good predictor. Uh -huh. It's really, the, the key is really, if you want to be a great president, is to push survival, to keep reminding people mm -hmm. of your ability to keep them safe and free, and to be a promoter of peace and safety. That is probably, for some reason, in the, in the public's eye, the greatest uh, function of a leader. Keep us safe and free. That seems and to be mastery. Mastery was oh. not a predictor. No mastery. Is what is mastery? You define the survival hope in a very clear way. Mastery is. I think mastery hope is is really. It's a little different from traditional achievement. What I believe it is, it's partly collaborative. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it different from optimism, for example. Yeah. Optimism, I think, is more solitary, more ego-driven, uh, yes. and more certain. Hope is more trust-based, more collaborative. And the goals of hope, there's some research on this, the goals of hope are more, are more uh, transcendent, more spiritual. Uh, yeah. And that, that's it, I, I guess. That's... It's a different so, kind of, uh, of mastery. Yeah. So, and if I, a client has low hope, how do you attempt to increase this well, kind? Well, yes, phase three is a clinical, mm -hmm. clinical applications. And this too is, is not simple. This is, this yeah. is a, 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 something I've thought about quite a bit. And the, 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 the two things that I'm working on right now is a workshop for young adults, teenagers, young adults, and it's focusing on fundamental hope. Uh, there was a philosopher, uh, Gabriel Marcel, mm. who distinguished ultimate hope and fundamental hope. Mm. Fundamental hope, yes. should I continue? Yeah. Fundamental hope is, is your foundation, your hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And ultimate hope is what you're aiming for. What are you ultimately aiming for? And I think with young adults and teenagers, especially those who have challenges in their lives, we should focus on fundamental right. hope. Now you could do both. You could try to build, let's say someone wants to develop a therapy for cancer patients. You might want to also strengthen their foundation, their fundamental hope, but then also build in a component that would be ultimate hope. What are the ultimate hopes of someone with cancer? They're not identical to the ultimate hopes of someone yes. with addiction, someone with a different kind of a problem, someone with long-term depression, mm -hmm. So the ultimate hopes can be a layer that changes depending on the problem, but there's always a layer underneath the fundamental right. hope. And, and so that's one thing I've been doing. Another thing I've been doing is working on, to, on the development of workshops, mm -hmm. I would say groups actually, for people with cancer, and to look at, to do a study where we compare um, a therapy that increases attachment, mastery, survival, and spirituality for those with cancer as they're going through treatment to increase their hope, but also then trying an experimental group which we'll call targeted hope therapy, where we identify what they're low in. Is it mastery, attachment, survival, and spirituality? And we focus specifically on that. So we do that. But one of the interesting things that I'm doing with my hope therapies is think of it as a box and going down, or a matrix, but going down one way You've got attachment, mastery, survival, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. You want to have elements of your therapy that hit all four. Ah. And then going the other way, I think you want to have three different modalities. You want to have what I call philosophical reflections or affirmations. Mm -hmm. You want to have cognitive behavioral exercises. Ah. And you want to have something which is meditative, hypnotic, almost hypnosis-like. Ah. And the reason for this is I'm really thinking more and more about the left brain and the right brain of hope. The explicit I, I saw this light. and the implicit. The explicit and the implicit. The conscious, the unconscious, the left brain, the right brain. Because the, the hope of, of, uh, of philosophers, poets, artists, mm. is a different kind of hope 
than cognitive psychologists discuss. And some people will even say, people who have been attracted to hope have stopped and said, I don't want to study it, it's too difficult. I don't know how you can get at that, that, that transcendent, emotional, unconscious hope. Well, I think you can. Yeah. I think you can. And I think you need to have a, an integrative psychotherapy and an integrative theory of hope when you cross them. So you have attachment, mastery, survival, and spirituality, and then you have the cognitive behavioral, the philosophical reflections, and the meditative hypnotic. Because the meditative hypnotic is mostly right brain, cognitive therapy is mostly left brain, and the other one, uh, the philosophical reflections, are mostly right brain with a little left brain too. Yes, I think that you encourage clients not to think in immediate goals, but this transcendent is also giving a meaning. Yes. yes. Yeah. Because it would be interesting to explore how uh, how this can be applied to. I think that European clients are more secular in a certain way, even if when they are religious. So transcendency may be more difficult to understand for them. But I think it could be very useful to to have the courage to introduce in. European therapy, the concept of uh, spirituality. So, the, 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 all the things you said about who was very inter interesting. I see there is some parallel concept with the mindfulness, but all, also you told me some differences. So, I give you the, the words. What do you see of similar? and also different. You have uh, many thoughts about this uh, you know, obsession it's interesting. with <laughs> mindfulness. Yeah, I, mindfulness is the rage. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's you know, a big deal. There's conferences, workshops, mindfulness for children, adults. Personally, I think it's too much. Mm -hmm. I think behind it is, I believe it's a Western corruption of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. What I think is really happening, this is my belief, mm -hmm. that They've um, uh, uh, incorporated Buddhism, they've transformed it, and in fact, they don't realize it, but I think what the West is doing is it's merely reinforcing their own paradigm, believing that they have moved outside of their own paradigm. For example, I don't yeah. think Buddha's main message was really about uh, mindfulness. I think it was more about being awake and about mm -hmm. being present, which is not really the same thing as mindfulness, but that's, that's for another day. But if I were to directly address mindfulness versus hope, I would say uh, there are great differences. I think maybe there are points of contact mm. if you get into trust, attachment, and maybe uh, that aspect of spirituality which has to do with um, connecting, connecting, where you want to be truly there and truly mm. present, like for mystics, this is, this is the be-all and end-all of hope. But having said that, I would, I would be critical I would be critical of, um, of mindfulness as the be-all and end-all of, of mental health for a number of reasons. I mean, I, I think that um, you know, philosophically, uh, uh, you could say that a great deal of pleasure mm -hmm. is not to be found in the moment, but to be found yes. in expectations and in future-mindedness. Mm -hmm. um, Rollo May, the humanistic psychologist, once said that um, our, our, our main core, our main core is mostly about becoming rather than being. Um, anatomically, physiologically, oh, if you yeah. look at the brain, a huge part of our anatomy, of our brain anatomy, is, is um, uh, devoted to future planning. It's what makes us humans. Animals, non-human animals, are in the moment. Yes. People That's... with Alzheimer's are in the moment. Do you want to trade your life for that of your dog or your cat? Do you want to have Alzheimer's? No. Do you want to not have a future? <laughs> what would it mean to not have a future? Um, I'm, I'm also thinking of research which shows that people who are more future-minded have less death anxiety. <laughs> There's research in that. And, and, you know, I think of Ecclesiastes. There's a beautiful passage yeah. in Ecclesiastes in the New Testament, you know. Sow your seeds in the morning. Mm -hmm. So you can plant, I'm sorry, plant your seeds in the morning yes. so that you can 
reap your harvest in the, in the, in the evening. Yeah. So you think that is sort of exceeding interest in some, in a dark interpretation of mindfulness, in mindfulness in a sort of an eternal present without no future. And this is a, not a hope, but a denial of anxiety. Well, I think, I think it's a good maybe. point, maybe, that, that one could say that, you know, John Paul II actually uh, critiqued Buddhism. He says it's, it's a philosophy of renunciation. And there is something to that. Um, you know, the be-all and end-all for, for many Buddhists is to um, eliminate suffering, even if it means leaving this world, mm -hmm. leave this world. And I, in my own clinical experience, I have often found that some of the practitioners and clients most invested in Buddhism have a trauma history. Mm -hmm. They have a trauma history. They're anxious. They're okay. afraid. And Buddhism gives them comfort. So you could say it's, it's, a, it's, it's hope in comfort and hope in, um, in liberation. And I find that, that Buddhists seem to be the most threatened by my research. Mm -hmm. They seem to be the most antagonized uh, by this. And they will often say, I don't believe in hope. I say, yes, you do. Your hope is just different. Yours is a hope to end suffering, to be liberated. OK, I, I think we are touching very complex things. Maybe we are preparing the terrain for another, uh, another interview. <laughs> yes. Okay, I, so I greet Anthony Scholli, and uh, Anthony, if you want to greet the leadership of State of Mind. <laughs> Grazie per, uh, per tutto. Uh, mi dispiace che non posso parlare l'italiano uh, più bene di, di questo. È un brutto dialetto napoletano, però <laughs> so fatto più male che poteva fare. Grazie. <laughs> Va bene, Grazie. E saluti da Washington. You know, as we're talking about this uh, comparison with mindfulness and future-mindedness and hope, I'm also thinking of this beautiful passage from the Bible, from Ecclesiastes. Sow your seeds in the morning so that you can reap the harvest in the evening. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a nice way to, to think about it, this connection between how you feel today and how you're going to feel in the future. And I guess one last thing that I'm thinking about is if you look at some of the research in positive psychology, uh, there was this whole wave of, of research on happiness. Now there seems to be more and more interest in savoring. And along with this interest in savoring, there's, there's an emphasis on individual differences in people who are ability to recall past happy moments and also anticipate future happiness. And that, that way it's extended in time. Mm -hmm. So that research on savoring also seems to suggest that you, you, you do need to have uh, a foot in the past, a foot in the present, and maybe you need a third foot in the future. Uh -huh. um, and, and also I would say, you know, think about it in the opposite way too. We have this phrase in English, don't become a prisoner of the moment. Ah, yes. So the moment can be liberating, the moment can be... Um, uh, gratifying, but the moment can also be a prison. Okay. It depends on the situation and what's around you.